Welcome to The Analytic Christian. I'm Jordan, and this is the channel that helps you explore Christian philosophy and theology. Today, we're going to be talking about the atonement, but this interview is going to stand out from the others that I've done. This one's going to focus more on the scriptural and theological side of things. Some of the other interviews I've done have focused more on a philosophical analysis of the doctrine of the atonement. So my guest is Dr. David Moffat. He is a reader in New Testament studies at the University of St. Andrews, and he's this is a pretty recent book within the past year, I believe, uh, called Rethinking the Atonement, Forward by N.T. Wright. He's no slouch. And uh, the, this book received some pretty high praise when I look at the endorsements. And Baker Academic was kind enough to send me a free copy. So I have based my questions today on the book. We're going to go through not every chapter. I, as I tried to put together questions, I realized I'm not going to be able to cover this whole <laughs> book. So I just tried to pick some of the ones that stood out to me. And thank you so much for coming on, Dr. Moffitt. Yeah, my pleasure. I really appreciate the invitation. I'm looking forward to, to the conversation. Let me ask you first, what led you to get to publish this book? I know at the beginning right. you say it's actually just a collection of papers that you've written and you added some chapters, but yes. why, why this project? Why put all this together in one volume? Yeah. Um, thanks. So uh, they are papers that I, I wrote and published m for the most part in other places that build on some ideas that uh, I, th I had been working on in my initial doctoral dissertation. Um, and it occurred to me that, well, I initially I had conceived of this as a set of papers dealing with different aspects of Jesus' death, resurrection, and ascension. And I thought they kind of hung together in a certain way, uh, if you thought about it that way. But as I discussed the idea of publishing them with Baker, um, Baker really said, look, you're, you're doing a lot of stuff with atonement here. Um, maybe you should think in in that way in terms of bringing the the papers together. And I thought that made a huge amount of sense. Um, not every chapter deals with atonement in quite the way that the majority of them in one way or another are doing. But, um, but it seemed to me that it would be a good way to kind of bring things that were scattered throughout various mainly scholarly journals uh, and a couple of books. Um, if I could just bring those together and have them, you know, handy, if anyone was interested in seeing certain kinds of lines of thinking that I have been developing um, somewhat piecemeal originally, um, but have been developing in the years subsequent to publishing my dissertation. So that was the genesis of this volume, um, bringing together these these different papers. And mm -hmm. uh, it, it doesn't quite flow the way one might expect from um, you know, a book that's advancing one clear argument. But I do think there are a number of things that tie together um, the various chapters, mainly focusing not just on one element of Jesus' life, but focusing actually on his death, his resurrection, and on his ascension. I think that's one of the things that makes this book stand out to me. So much of the literature that I'm aware of focuses on Jesus's death as mm. playing this crucial role in the atonement. And you yeah. don't deny that, that it plays no, a no, really it, important the, role. The death of Jesus is absolutely essential. It is crucial. It is doing huge amounts of work. Uh, some people right. have misread me on this point. Um, but I mean, we can talk about that more if you'd like. Yes, but, we, yeah. we will get into that. But you titled yeah. the book rethinking the atonement yeah why don't you yeah. say just briefly what exactly is it that we're rethinking about the atonement right well it it touches on what you were just um talking about the the rethinking element is effectively saying there's more going on to the atoning work that jesus does to save his people from their sins than just the death of jesus um it's that I think it's fair to say, uh, of course, 
this doesn't apply to everyone, but I think it's fair to say that in the main, there has in, especially in sort of modern theological reflection, been a kind of reductive approach to the question of the atonement. And it's that reductionism has played out in a way that the crucifixion, the death of Jesus, is often viewed as the historical event uh, at which all the work that Jesus does to save his people is completed. Um, and then if you take that kind of an approach to the atonement, then a text like uh, John 19, uh, 30, where Jesus says, it is finished, can can become almost like a proof text to say, see, there you go. Everything that had to be done to save us was done uh, at the crucifixion. I'm suggesting that we need to rethink that um, based on, uh, initially, on work that I did in the book of Hebrews that um, forced me to completely rethink the way I understood sacrifice. Um, and Hebrews kept pushing me. It, I should perhaps back up one step here. As I looked at the book of Hebrews, I thought I was seeing ways in which Jesus' resurrection um, as a discrete event, as a bodily event, um, was significant for parts of the argumentation in the book of Hebrews. Um, I know when I say these sorts of things, I occasionally will get people say, but, but wait, what do you mean? Every people question the resurrection in Hebrews? Like, well, actually, yes, they do, especially in modern scholarship. Um, there has been a tendency, and it really kind of goes across the board theologically, to assume, or even sometimes pointedly argue, that Jesus' resurrection was not significant for the argument in Hebrews about how Jesus uh, makes atonement. Um, and I, I didn't get into the resurrection question in Hebrews to address the atonement point. Uh, it hadn't actually even occurred to me. Um, I got into Hebrews to really just address the resurrection point because I saw this modern literature saying it's not that important. But as I looked at the text, it seemed to me that there were places where it was important. And the more that I pushed out that argument, the more I began to, to think that when Hebrews, especially in chapters 7 through 10, um, particularly 9 and 10, begins to talk about Jesus presenting himself before the Father in the heavenly holy of holies, um, in particular in chapter 9, suddenly if the resurrection was there, that looked to me like it had to be something that was subsequent to the crucifixion. Um, I couldn't make Jesus present presenting himself as a sacrifice to the Father in this heavenly space equivalent to uh, either logically or temporally equivalent to his death on the cross. And that for me, that sent me on a path to start rethinking sacrifice um, because I could not understand what Hebrews was doing. It made no sense to me at all. Uh, I knew that sacrifice was about killing an animal. Um, I assumed that you killed the animal on an altar and all of that seemed to make the cross uh, the place of Jesus' sacrifice where he dies on an altar and offers himself to God. But with the resurrection in Hebrews, suddenly Hebrews seem to be saying, no, you need to look at where Jesus is now in this heavenly location where he offers himself to the Father and now actively intercedes on our behalf. Um, anyway, to kind of shorten that a bit, this pushed me back to Leviticus because I just thought, like, I, I cannot understand what's going on with this sacrifice stuff. How, why is Hebrews, if this resurrection point is correct, why why does Hebrews then seem to read as if Jesus is offering himself in heaven? And it was with that in mind and going back and rereading Leviticus that it, it occurred to me and I subsequently discovered a good many Hebrew Bible scholars have been saying this sort of thing. But suddenly it occurred to me that actually in Leviticus, there was a lot more attention placed on what happened after you killed the animal uh, than on the slaughter of the animal per se. So there was a kind of focus in Leviticus on taking blood and flesh to an altar 
and offering the sacrifice to God, which was something that occurred subsequent to killing the animal. Um, that then seemed to be a, an approach to sacrifice that um, correlated or lined up with the logic uh, of Hebrews in ways that, that really had surprised me and that I didn't anticipate. So with rethinking sacrifice like that, then it was like, well, wait a minute. If sacrifice actually focuses on bringing a gift into God's presence and not just on killing something, as if that's the center of it, then what about atonement? Um, so that brought me back to having to rethink what's going on with atonement, um, primarily because a text like Leviticus 17.11 which talks about blood uh, being life and the blood being applied to the altar, making atonement, put the focal point again on the altar, um, not on the killing of the animal, which doesn't occur on the altar. Uh, and it was things like that, that that began to push me to, to think there must be more going on. If Hebrews understood sacrifice in that way, um, there must be more going on with this idea of atonement than just Jesus dying on the cross. Mm -hmm. Perhaps I should pause there and <laughs> see if there are things you want to unpack or push me on. No, no. I, I think I'll say it like this. If there is a kind of overarching thesis to the book, it would, I, I would say it's this, you can correct me if you think it's something different. Jesus's death which everyone's going to agree with this part, but also his resurrection and his ascension play crucial roles in his atoning work. If you yeah. leave out the resurrection and ascension part, you're missing something very, very important. Yes, that's my often, argument. You're right. Often it seems like the resurrection part, almost nothing is said about the ascension part. <laughs> yes, right, but, right. <laughs> but some people will say, ah, oh, well, the resurrection was was important because that was God's way of communicating that the sacrifice was accepted. Right. And I think you'd probably agree, like, yeah, the, there's an element. There, that's true. It's not like that's that's uh, incorrect, but yeah. that's not all that the resurrection is, right. is doing. So I would qualify that a bit. I, I would suggest that there's an element of vindication in the resurrection. That's absolutely there. That Jesus' resurrection shows that, G, uh, that God approved of Jesus and that God approved of the way he lived and died. In terms of accepting the sacrifice, if in fact uh, the acceptance of the sacrifice has more to do with presenting the sacrifice to God, and then God, uh, in a certain way, signaling, yes, I'm happy with this sacrifice, then um, I would still want to even push a little bit beyond what you suggested by saying that the acceptance of the sacrifice is really when God invites Jesus to sit at his right hand. This is the moment. So, so it's uh, even the acceptance of the sacrifice is not the resurrection. Um, the acceptance is when Jesus shows up as Hebrews seems to think about this in the heavenly Holy of Holies and God invites Jesus to sit at his right hand. That is God accepting the son um, in his resurrected state as um, a human being now and forever um, accepting the son back and inviting the son to sit. That's where I, I would see the acceptance of the sacrifice. But, but in terms of the resurrection and vindication of Jesus and vindication of Jesus' claims, absolutely. Okay, so the remainder of this interview, what I want to do, we'll focus mostly on the book of Hebrews. Yeah. At the end, we'll talk a bit about Acts. Okay. But what I want the viewer to, so they have a sense of what's coming, we're going to see in the book of Hebrews how the death, resurrection, ascension, and at the end we'll talk about exaltation as well. Yeah, uh, how all of this works together uh, comes together really nicely in the atoning work of Christ. So let's focus on the death first. Sure. <clears throat> okay. So how does the author of the book of Hebrews compare Jesus's death mm. to Moses's performance of the first Passover, and what does right. that tell us about the atonement? Right. Yeah. Thanks. That's a great question. Um, 
if I can add one qualification before going into Hebrews per se, um, it's never been, uh, I've never sought to, to present some kind of systematic theological account of atonement uh, only on the basis of Hebrews. Um, anything, so I add that as a qualification because sometimes people will read or hear things I say about Hebrews and then say, well, that can't be right because what about these other texts? Like, well, yes, there are these other texts, they matter. But if we're trying to understand Hebrews on its own terms, if we think that that's valuable, um, then we need to try and allow Hebrews own categories to point us to how this author is thinking, which doesn't in any way um, necessarily exclude uh, input from other passages in the New Testament. But that would be a more synthetic move and a move that would um, lead to more theological, synthetic theological conclusions. So I hope that's clear. Um, so with that in mind, uh, how does Hebrews seem to appeal to the Passover uh, and the work of Moses? Uh, it seems to me, and not many scholars, a few see this, but not many have, have argued this, that in Hebrews chapter 2, there are actually allusions to the Passover, uh, and that these allusions would be recognized um, plausibly could be viewed as being recognized by Second Temple Jews who know some of the other traditions about the Passover that existed. Um, there's a lot of literature that it that we have evidence of from this period of time around when Jesus was alive that suggests that um, people had other interpretive traditions when they read their scriptures. They didn't read scripture in a vacuum. Um, if I can give a brief illustration, I think when we think of Passover today, many of us are going to think, oh, the angel of death was the agent who struck down the firstborn. Um, we're, we're actually, probably many of us will just read Exodus 12 and assume that that's what's going on. But of course, there's no angel of death in Exodus 12. Um, it's actually the Lord who does the striking in almost every case, but one. In Exodus 12, verse 23, there's a reference to this figure, the destroyer. And the blood is there to prevent the destroyer from entering the houses of the Israelites and striking down their firstborn. Now, this idea of the destroyer is um, something that some Second Temple Jews really thought about. Who or what is this figure, the destroyer? And in many ways, those traditions are actually the background for our tradition about an angel of death, okay? But in the Second Temple period, there's some evidence that this destroyer figure uh, was associated with Satan um, or the devil. Uh, in the book of Jubilees, uh, we get an account of Exodus, of the Exodus, in which this figure, Mastema, who um, is the Satan figure, uh, is an agent in play fighting against the God of Israel and against Moses. He actually possesses Pharaoh. So in those places where God hardens Pharaoh's heart, uh, Jubilees tends to view that as Mastema at work, preventing Pharaoh from doing the right thing and letting the people go. But then uh, in particular, this, this verse, Exodus 12, 23, seems to be picked up in Jubilees as a way of talking about Mastema and Mastema's forces of evil uh, going out and striking down the firstborn. They seem to be viewed as the destroyer who goes out and strikes down the firstborn. Um, I have no idea if Hebrews has read Jubilees. That's not what I'm trying to claim. But a tradition like that, where the Exodus and what Moses does with blood, uh, the blood of the lamb on the door frames, um, a tradition like that suggests that there were Second Temple Jews who viewed the Exodus not just as a liberation from enslavement to Pharaoh and the Egyptians, but also as liberation from, at least temporarily, from this spiritual enemy who is determined to destroy God's people 
this Satan figure um, whom Jubilees calls Mastema. Now, if you read Hebrews 2 with that in mind, when Hebrews 2 talks about the death of Jesus uh, being the means by which the devil is defeated, then you begin to think like, huh, what if, what if this author is aware of these larger traditions about Exodus not just being liberation from Pharaoh, but being in some way a liberation from the destroyer or from the devil, uh, then it could be a way in which the author reads or, or refers to the death of Jesus in a Passover category that people who know those traditions might be able to recognize in ways that if we don't know them, we might not. Um, and that would be a way then, if this is true, of the author saying the death of Jesus functions like the past, the death of the Passover lamb and the application of the blood of the Passover lamb. Um, in that, it in some way is able to defeat the power of the destroyer, the devil. Now, actually, when we keep reading Hebrews, in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 28, one of the few places where the author explicitly refers to Moses in the Passover, he actually goes exactly to Exodus 12, 23, because he says that the blood that Moses used was able to defeat the destroyer. Uh, so in Hebrews eleven twenty eight, 28, he shows us very clearly that he thinks that what Moses did at Passover was effective at doing something to prevent the power of the destroyer from um, de killing the firstborn. These two points seem to suggest that Hebrews really is thinking about the death of Jesus in a way that would make a great deal of sense to early Christians who had these traditions about Jesus dying at Passover, um, that he's thinking about the death of Jesus as an event, which in some way defeats this malevolent angelic being who has, according to Hebrews, held the people in slavery by the fear of death, that Jesus' death defeats that, defeats that figure, and liberates the people from that enslaving power. Now, right there again, this idea of liberation from enslavement is most likely going to call up ideas of Passover and Exodus for Second Temple Jews. I mean, even many of us today, I think, would think of Passover and Exodus when we think about God liberating his people from an enslaving power. But then one more point um, that I think really indicates there is something to this thesis is that after chapter 2, the writer in Hebrews 3 and 4 moves to Israel in the wilderness. Well, where is Israel after the Exodus? Where does Moses take them? He leads them into the wilderness. So the fact that <laughs> Hebrews talks about the death of Jesus defeating the devil, liberating people from the enslaving power of death, and then almost immediately moves into talking about um, these early Christians in terms that recall Israel in the wilderness. All of these things together suggest that Hebrews is thinking intentionally uh, about the death of Jesus as a kind of new Passover event, an event that liberates people not now from Pharaoh uh, in Egypt, but ultimately liberates them from the enslavement of this uh, malevolent angelic figure, the devil, who is intent on trying to destroy them and keep them away from God by enslaving them. So that, if that's right, is uh, one way to understand. It's not the only way, but it's one way to understand the essential work of salvific, the essential salvific work that Jesus' death is doing in the book of Hebrews. Um, and yet there's more for Hebrews because even salvation itself in Hebrews has is about more than just being liberated from the devil and from the fear of death. Yeah, so let me give the viewer a specific couple of verses. I'm by no means saying everything you said boils down to these two verses. It's just <laughs> right. a way of showing them, okay, there's there's things here in the text that map onto what you're saying. So this is in Hebrews 2, verses 
14 and 15 is what I'm going right. to pick at. Mm. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to pick up in, in 14 so that through death, he talking about Jesus could destroy the one who holds the power of death. That is the devil and set free those who were held in slavery all their lives by their fear of death. Mm. Um, okay. I, we could go on. It's, it's not just that little section, but that, that says it's, uh, there's this person holding the power of death and it, uh, Hebrews identifies that as the devil and Jesus sets free those who were held in slavery. It does call to mind the Exodus and, and, what you were just saying so everything there just i i asked you that question in particular because that's showing us what the death of jesus the role that the death of jesus plays in hebrews it's or at least kind of one weird. thing that that the death of jesus does yes that's right mm -hmm. it's uh kind of this liberation and would you say that this also is I don't know if you mentioned anything about this yet, but in the book you talk about the establishment of a new covenant as right. well. Do you want to say anything about that here? Yeah. So in Hebrews chapter eight, the author cites um, an extensive bit from Jeremiah 31. Uh, this is the longest citation of Jewish scripture in the New Testament text. Um, and Jeremiah 31, which is, of course, uh, this text that promises that God is going to make a new covenant with his people, actually brings together um, the Exodus, Exodus chapter 12, the story of Israel being liberated, and the inauguration of the Mosaic covenant. This is in Exodus 24, uh, when God makes a covenant between himself and his people. Um so in Jeremiah 31, there's this comment that um, God, through the prophet, says, uh, I made a covenant with you when I took you by the hand and led you out of Egypt. Um, so it seems like conceptually, Passover, Exodus, and inauguration of the Mosaic Covenant are held closely together. Um, and I, I think that makes a certain kind of sense. Um these things sequentially, one follows the other. First, the people are liberated, then they go to Sinai, uh, and God makes a covenant. Um, and I think Hebrews, uh, looking at Jeremiah 31 in particular, is also thinking about these ideas being very closely connected. Um, and this would suggest, and he seems to hint at some of this idea in Hebrews chapter 9, that... Um, the death of Jesus not only is an event that can be seen as meaningful and seen as bringing some kind of real salvific benefit to his people because it defeats the devil and brings that liberation, as 2.14 through 15 say, but also can be seen as meaningful and significant because it is the event that inaugurates the long-promised new covenant that Jeremiah, the prophet, had talked about. So this is yet another way in which the death of Jesus is doing something that is changing the situation and bringing salvific benefits to his people. Um, and in particular, uh, in Hebrews 9, uh, 20 through 22, there are these references to Moses sprinkling um, blood when the old covenant is being inaugurated. And in some ways, Jesus' death is being linked with that kind of um, inaugurating event. Um, so that's yet another way in which uh, the establishment of the new covenant, that is, is yet another way in which the death of Jesus is actually doing some kind of um, absolutely essential salvific work on behalf of his people, those who, who find themselves now coming into this covenant relationship with God, which Jesus inaugurated. All right. Now I'd like to shift to the resurrection and then ascension. So, yeah. Because this, this will be, maybe the viewers like, well, all of that stuff I'm, I'm somewhat familiar with. Again, that's focusing on the crucial part that the death plays.
But now let's think about the resurrection and ascension. So how does the author of the book of Hebrews connect Jesus' resurrection and ascension to his atoning work? Right. Um, one of the things we have to think about here is exactly what we mean when we use this language of atonement. Um, at the very beginning of the book, uh, I talk briefly about what I think uh, is a problem with the language of atonement. It goes back at least to Tyndale and his translation uh, of language in Greek, meaning reconciliation, um, with this, this language of atonement, at one mint, um, which seems to actually be a very good word for talking about reconciling two estranged parties. Um, and then, of course, the verb to atone, to bring these estranged parties together. Tyndale first translates the New Testament uh, from Greek. And so he first um, uses this language of atonement, especially when he's looking at Paul in Romans 5.11 and in 2 Corinthians 5.18 through 20, where Paul says the death of Jesus reconciles uh, God and humanity. Um, now, we could talk about exactly what Paul means there, but uh, what's interesting to me in terms of this language is that when Tyndale subsequently begins to translate the Hebrew Bible into English, which he, he starts after he did the um, Greek New Testament into English, he uses this verb to atone, this language of atonement, with Jewish, with certain parts of Levitical sacrifice uh, in the Pentateuch. Um, so all throughout Leviticus, the Hebrew verb for what happens when you apply blood to, a, to the altar uh, and some other instances, the verb is kipper, um, he translates uh, with the language of atonement and the language of reconciliation again. Now that I think introduces a possible Confu conceptual confusion because number one it suggests that the activity of what a priest does with sacrificial uh, blood on an altar is equivalent to what Paul thinks Jesus death is doing um, I think it's at least possible that that might be uh, a kind of anachronistic understanding of what's going on with Levitical sacrifice. But second of all, when we actually look at Levitical sacrifice, the language of God granting forgiveness when sacrifice has to do with dealing with either sin or ritual impurity, this language always follows whatever happens on the altar. Um, and what's more, God is never the object, the direct object of the action of what happens on the altar when a priest applies blood. Um, and that's very odd. If applying blood to an altar makes reconciliation with God, you would expect that God would be the object of this verb. But that doesn't happen in these sacrificial contexts. Uh, now, why might all this be significant? Because it's at least possible that by translating the language in Leviticus, um, this verb kaper, with the language of atonement, Tyndale might be sort of jumping the gun a bit. That is, he's pointing to something that is really a, a sacrificial dynamic. There is a reconciliation that happens between God and people as a result of sacrifice. But rather than allowing us to see the mechanism that might be in play in uh, what happens on an altar, he puts the end result already there and translates that verb, which does seem to be a verb that has more to do with a removal of something or a purification. He makes it to make atonement. Uh, so that, for English readers, doesn't quite allow us to see what's going on or what's potentially going on uh, with this, this uh, Hebrew verb. All that is to say that we then have another, or all that leads to yet another potential point of confusion with atonement language. In our modern way of talking about this, it's very common for us to think about atonement as almost equivalent to soteriology. That is, we use atonement almost like an umbrella term 
under which a number of different ideas can then be located. Um, and we can think about all of these ideas as the atonement. And then if we think that that's what sacrifice is also all about, and that all of that's done on the cross, this is where we get back to some of what we discussed earlier, these reductive, the, the potential for a reductionistic idea about what's going on with Jesus' work on the cross. Um, now, where might that actually then impact on thinking about Hebrews and the atonement? Well, okay, on the one hand, if we want to use atonement to refer to all of Jesus' saving work, where atonement becomes this kind of equivalent to soteriology, then Hebrews is going to talk about Jesus' salvific death, his salvific resurrection, his salvific ascension, his salvific intercession. In some ways, this could all be viewed as atonement. But if we want to focus on what happens in Levitical sacrifice, okay, and if we want to allow that that might be a distinct thing that's not equivalent to all these other things that are salvific. Well, then we need to start thinking about what exactly is going on when a verse like Leviticus 17.11 talks about blood applied to an altar making doing this compare work, this making atonement um, in many English translations. Okay, now if we step back a moment and go back to the conversation about Levitical sacrifice not being focused only on the killing of an animal. One of the things that I think, if people will go back and read Leviticus, that becomes clear when you start thinking about it in these ways, is that there are a whole series of things that happen when you offer a sacrifice. Um, it has to be said that not all sacrifice involves killing an animal. Uh, some sacrifices giving grain or oil or wine. But in those cases where sacrifice involves killing an animal, the animal is killed before the blood and the flesh are actually brought to the altar. And only a priest, after the animal is killed, can bring the blood and the flesh to the altar. And this language that we get from Tyndale translated as atonement occurs not when you kill the animal, but when you bring blood in particular to the altar and apply it to the altar and to other parts of, of the tabernacle in Leviticus. That all suggests that within sacrifice itself, there is a kind of series of things that occur, and it actually, relative to God's presence, moves in a particular direction. It moves from an offerer who brings an animal to the tabernacle. In Leviticus, um, the, in the Hebrew version of Leviticus, the offerer is usually thought to be the one who kills the animal, slaughters it. Then a priest collects the blood in a bowl, and the priest then takes the bowl and with the blood and begins applying it to the altar in different ways, depending on different sacrifices. Now, if Hebrews can think in those ways, then a couple of things need to be said. One, it's clear that the altar is not the place where you kill the animal. And if Hebrews knows that, then the death of Jesus and the cross are not likely to have been immediately viewed as the altar, where Jesus is slaughtered. You don't slaughter animals on the altar. But then two, um, if only a priest can bring the blood and the flesh to the altar, and if the altar is a focal point where these things are offered to God for him to accept or not, um, then we have to start thinking like, well, what happens after Jesus' death? And this is where the resurrection becomes potentially significant. Um, for a couple of reasons. One, Hebrew seems to suggest in chapter 7, uh, it's a very complicated argument and we may not want to get into it too much, but Hebrew seems to suggest that, uh, or at least I've argued, um, that Jesus' resurrection is really what qualifies him to be the high priest who can enter the heavenly 
tabernacle, the heavenly holy of holies, and perform his high priestly ministry there. So that's one way in which the resurrection is significant. But another way in which the resurrection is significant is this would, if we take this idea that sacrifice involves a number of different elements, the resurrection is something that occurs after the death and would actually be the means by which that allow Jesus to bring his own blood and flesh before the Father and offer them to the Father as his sacrifice. And here we have to think about sacrifice not as the act of killing, but as the actual things that are offered to God. When you give God a sacrifice in Leviticus, you give God a particular animal. And you give God that animal by bringing its blood and flesh, parts of its flesh, to altars. And in some cases on the Day of Atonement, for example, by bringing the blood all the way into the Holy of Holies, into God's presence. So the resurrection in that sense is, um, it, it at least seems uh, really intriguing to think that the resurrection might be correlated with, by analogy, uh, elements of the bigger process of offering God a sacrifice. And the resurrection would be this part in which after the sacrifice has been slaughtered, now the blood and flesh can be brought before God by a priest. Um, these are things that I think the resurrection uh, are, are doing in the bigger logic of Hebrews' argument. In Leviticus, slaughtering the animal, if that's all that happened, if they just killed the animal and then nothing else happened after that, atonement would not have been achieved. That's right. That's exactly right, because the blood and the flesh have not been taken to the altar. They've yeah, not which, actually been offered to God. Yes. Uh, so the blood represents this life in Leviticus, and you offer this perfect life as a means of like purification, cleansing, something like that. When when the people sin, it pollutes the temple. It's almost like this they've trashed the place, almost like graffiti yeah, or right. something. Yeah, that's and the right. blood is like a cleanser that, or uh, yeah, like a cleanser that you wipe away all this toxic junk that you know you've put out all over the temple when you trashed it and that seems anyway from previous interviews i've done that seems to be a common way of thinking about what's going on in leviticus i think this is right and it's part of what i meant when i talked about this verb keper in hebrew that gets translated by tyndale to make atonement it really means something like to remove or to purify um that's what's going on in, in exactly the way that that you discussed it, um, or at least seems to be most plausibly going on in Leviticus. Yeah. Okay. So once you see that in Leviticus, the death alone, the death is, is a means of getting the blood mm. and it, it's not enough just to like, you know, prick the animal. And, right. Uh, it has, to, this again, represents the animal's life to give the, the, the life of the, the animal's got to, give up its life in order to offer that life to God. Um, so it seems like death is an appropriate means to communicate that this life, this perfect life, it's supposed to be a, a spotless. I know there's different types of sacrifices, but in the case of an animal sacrifice, it's this perfect life that's being offered. You do that by means of killing the animal to get this blood. The blood's the really important bit because that's when you're going to take that and apply it to the altar and make purification. Um, so Jesus's death alone, if, if that, if Hebrews has in mind what's going on in Leviticus, the death alone is not sufficient. It's the blood has to be applied in, on the altar. But then the idea is this implies that there's gotta be a priest who takes the blood and applies it, not to just the earthly one, uh, you, this is like the establishment, I guess, of a new covenant. You're taking this one to the to the to the real to the tabernacle source, that right? exists in yeah. heaven, the source. Yeah, uh, and it's going to be applied there. And so, what Hebrews is arguing is Jesus is that high priest who takes his own blood and applies it in the tabernacle that exists in heaven. Is that yeah, right? Exactly. Now, 
how exactly that happens, what exactly that looks like, Hebrews never explains. Um, and uh, there are certainly elements of metaphor that are in play. Um, but I would want to suggest that more than just metaphor, and in some ways more significantly, significantly than metaphor, are arguments that are coming from analogies that are based on, here's how things happen in the earthly tabernacle. And I think we can read that also in terms of the earthly temple, although the author only focuses on the tabernacle, probably because he's so interested in this wilderness period. And of course, in the wilderness, the people have the tabernacle. Um, but yeah, Exodus 20, um, 25, 40 uh, says very clearly that um, Moses, God commands Moses to make everything on earth according to the pattern that was shown to him when he ascended the mountain, when he was on the mountain. And there, again, not unlike the Jubilees point that uh, I discussed earlier, there are second temple traditions which associate Moses' ascent of Sinai with him actually entering in some way the heavenly realm. And when he is in that heavenly realm, he is able to see, however it's conceived, <laughs> some kind of heavenly tabernacle stroke temple. Uh, and that's what allows him to then set up the priesthood and set up the tabernacle on earth in a way that uh, has specific parallels or analogies between what happens in that space and what Moses himself actually saw when whatever it was he saw when he was on Sinai. Uh, so that that's actually a, a biblical point um, that gets developed in particular ways in the Second Temple by some Second Temple Jews. That would then suggest that um, if you're thinking about somebody entering heaven, whether it's heaven itself or a space within the heavens, which is what I argue for, but that's not nearly as, as important as this bigger idea, that when someone uh, can be imagined as ascending, passing through the heavens to enter that heavenly tabernacle, there are actually biblical uh, parallels and models for how you should think about what's happening in that space. And the primary one is the Day of Atonement, which is described in Leviticus chapter 16. On the Day of Atonement, it's not just a priest who goes into the tabernacle. It's the high priest and only the high priest and only one time a year. And he, do, he goes with blood, uh, which he, according to Hebrews 9, 7, he offers uh, and it's the offering of this blood in the heavenly holy of holies, which brings some kind of sanctification for the people. The writer actually says, talks about this in Hebrews 13, 11. Um, so it's the blood going into the holy of holies that then brings about some kind of, again, salvific benefit for the people within that covenant relationship. This, this is where, um, and forgive me if I, if I wasn't very clear on this point uh, a few minutes ago, but this is where sacrificial atonement is happening by bringing the blood. And in the case of the Holy of Holies on earth, the high priest sprinkles the blood uh, when it was there on the Ark of the Covenant. And that affects some kind of atonement, some kind of sanctification or purification that allows for God and God's people to dwell together safely, so long as God accepts this particular sacrifice. And I think Hebrews then is working with analogies that look at that, that look at Leviticus 16, and then think, well, what if you transpose this, as it were, to that heavenly reality? And this is a natural thing for someone like the author of Hebrews to imagine precisely because he believes in some way there is a heavenly tabernacle. And that he says in 8.5, he cites this text from Exodus, that Moses was to make everything in accordance with what was shown to him on the mountain. Uh, so he thinks already that there are these parallel tabernacles or maybe even temples in, in the cosmos. And if Jesus goes into the one in heaven, whatever he's doing, there are analogies, there are parallels between what he's doing and 
and what the earthly high priest did. Um, now, if you slot, again, the resurrection in, um, not only does it qualify Jesus to be high priest, according to the argument of Hebrews 7, not only does it give him blood and flesh that he can then offer or present to the Father as a sacrifice, which he actually seems to say in Hebrews 9, 24 through 26, that Jesus enters heaven itself there to appear before God for us uh, and to offer himself uh, the sacrifice of himself. Um, so not only is all of that going on, but then equally in Jesus passing through the heavens and entering the heavenly holy of holies, he is then presenting the very sacrifice, which by some kind of analogy to the high priest going into the Holy of Holies on the Day of Atonement, which is making sanctification and some or some kind of atoning, uh, having some kind of atoning effect on behalf of his people. Um, and that's where, again, if we think about atonement in the big category of all the saving work of Jesus, well, there's a lot going on. But if we think about atonement in this more narrow category as what happens in sacrifice, based on uh, the fact that Tyndale has sort of, we've inherited that from Tyndale's translation. Well, then that part of Jesus' work is exactly what happens when, like the high priest going into the Holy of Holies on earth, Jesus ascends and goes into the Holy of Holies in heaven. That's where, ultimately, um, in this rethinking of the atonement, uh, that's where I would argue that Hebrews is actually thinking in ways that are highly analogous, uh, highly parallel to what happens on earth on the Day of Atonement, and that that's the sort of argument that would make very good sense to other Jews. They might not agree with it. I'm not suggesting that. But they could understand the logic of this, because that's how they would be thinking about the atoning effect of offering this blood in the Holy of Holies on the Day of Atonement. Jesus does it by ascending, entering the heavenly Holy of Holies, and presenting his own blood and flesh, his own resurrected self, before the Father. Uh, and the Father accepts the sacrifice because the Father invites Jesus to sit at his right hand. Now, there's yes, even the, more when we start thinking about intercession, but yeah, go ahead. Yeah, we're, we're coming up on the one hour mark, so I want to wrap up within the next like five, well, sure. uh, within the next five to seven minutes here. Yeah. So hopefully the viewer's understanding, okay, it looks like the resurrection, Jesus being brought back to life. Now, you didn't get into this part. You say that one of the things you argue in the book is the resurrection actually qualifies Jesus as being high priest yeah like that's yeah so we didn't that get into seems to be the argument of hebrews 7 but right, that's where right. all that fun melchizedek stuff comes in yeah. yes yes he's a high priest in the order of melchizedek now we're, we don't have time to, yeah. to get into that but maybe that would entice the viewer to get the book <laughs> look at it there's there's so much more to the book than we can cover in this interview but the resurrection plays a crucial element there in in the role that jesus can play as high priest and then his ascension is like him going into this Holy of Holies exactly. on the Day of Atonement. Okay, so it looks like the resurrection and ascension play this really important role. Let's finish by talking about the exaltation of Jesus. Yeah, yeah. Um, I know I didn't give you much time to to elaborate <laughs> on this, but yeah, what what's the significance of Jesus's exaltation? And you talk a bit in the book about the role that this plays in the book of Acts. So you can bring in Acts here as well. Sure. Yeah. So, I mean, the exaltation is, is hugely important. And once again, I would really urge that even what I suggest uh, in the next few minutes shouldn't be taken as a reductive account, as if this is all that the exaltation does. Um, nevertheless, there are elements in Hebrews where the exaltation is clearly linked with Jesus as the Davidic scion, the Davidic messianic uh, figure, the anointed king, who sits on the throne at God's right hand. And Hebrews kicks off with this assumption um, that Jesus enters the heavenly, uh, I think he's in Hebrews 1 referring to Jesus entering the heavenly holy of holies, and then is invited to sit where no angelic being has ever been invited to sit at God's right hand. 
Why can he sit there? Hebrews 2 gives us the reason because Jesus is the son of man that Psalm 8 refers to. Um, and it's precisely as a human being that the eternal son of God now, and again, this is because of the resurrection. The resurrection means that the eternal son of God is now and forever also a human being. Uh, he didn't leave his humanity behind when he died. Um, and so when he ascends, he actually takes his humanity with him. He's still Jesus <laughs> uh, and enters this heavenly space and is exalted precisely as the ultimate heir to the promises uh, that God gave to David, that one of his seed would sit at his right hand and rule forever. So that's one way in which the exaltation is important. Um, now, interestingly, when we see this referred to in a few other places, like in the book of Acts, we get this really interesting comment in Acts 5.31. And it, it was the kind of thing that jumped out at me after I had done this work on Hebrews. Because in Acts 5.31, Peter and John are before the Sanhedrin. And Peter says, um, this Jesus who was crucified, God raised up and exalted to his right hand as um, forerunner uh, or Lord and Savior in order to give repentance and forgiveness of sins to Israel. Now that's really interesting because right there, Acts 5.31 seems to have the same kind of focus for the ability of sin to be dealt with as it looks to me like Hebrews seems to focus on. It's the exaltation. It's when Jesus is there before the Father and invited to sit at the Father's right hand that now, for some reason, that allows for forgiveness and repentance to occur according to Acts 5.31. Now, I think the reason that underlies what Acts is arguing is explained in detail in the book of Hebrews. But that would mean then that the exaltation is not just this royal, uh, it's not just playing on this royal idea of Jesus as Messiah, as Christ, who is seated at God's right hand. It's also playing on these high priestly ideas of Jesus as the one who now is interceding as high priest on behalf of his people. And uh, again, Hebrews 7.25 actually says very clearly that Jesus is able to save his people fully, completely, because he always lives to intercede for them. Now, if, if I can, just in the last couple of seconds here, raise a question that I think is worthy of some thought. If it really is the case that the death of Jesus does all the work that saves God's people, if there's nothing apart from that, then why do we need someone to intercede on our behalf before the Father now? Um, and you can put the question differently. What would happen if Jesus stopped interceding for us? And I think Hebrews, as well as other passages like Paul in Romans 8.34, who talks about Jesus who died, yes, but rose, seated at the right hand of God, interceding for us. He's alluding to Psalm 110 again, uh, but also other passages like 1 John and, you know, arguably this text in Acts. These are passages which point 1 John 1, 7 through 2, 2, where Jesus is actively serving as our advocate with the Father. Um, these are passages which seem to suggest that throughout the New Testament, the exaltation of Jesus as Messiah to the Father's right hand is itself participating in making salvation possible for God's people, precisely because he's not just ruling as king, but he is also acting as high priest, actively interceding. That would suggest that this new covenant relationship, which Jesus inaugurates with his death, is now being maintained in a way that, again, is analogous to what the Mosaic Covenant, the Old Covenant, was doing. It's precisely the intercession of a priest, in this case, the high priest, 
presenting, being the sacrifice present before the Father, which is allowing for this ongoing work of, um, I think the language we might want to use would be sanctification. Um, also this ongoing work of forgiveness um, for God's people in the new covenant. These are ways in which I think the exaltation uh, is really uh, very significant. And if, if any of these points are more or less on target, then the, the key takeaway I hope is that um, salvation, atonement in a big sense, requires not just the death of Jesus, but also the resurrection, also the ascension, also the ongoing intercession, and indeed the looked for return um, in order for this to be full salvation. You summed up that concluding point like super well. We'll leave it there. I really hope the viewers will check out this book, Rethinking the Atonement. It was very illuminating for me. It It's no exaggeration to say that it did make me rethink the atonement. And in a good <laughs> way, I I see uh, the, the force of uh, the kind of arguments you're making. So thank you so much for coming on. I yeah, really thanks. appreciate having you. Yeah, thanks for um, giving me a space to talk about some of these issues. I'd like to make sure I say thank you to Baker for sending me a copy of the book. And I've put the link to the book in the description. So if you're interested in purchasing a copy, just click that link in the description. All right. Thank you for watching and keep exploring Christianity.